Okay, we're onward to our second steady flow engineering device, or I guess set, I should say. And those are turbines and compressors. What are these? Fans. Very, very, very fancy fans. You're like, so the thing in my house is a turbine or a compressor? Well, it would be kind of like a compressor. It's just a very inefficient one. But just when you think about these things, just think fans and just that they're very fancy, okay? To make it a little bit simpler. Okay, so what is a turbine? Well, a turbine, it drives electric generator. And what's happening is you have air, it blows on the turbine blades, it causes them to spin, just like a windmill, and then that spins electric generator, which causes power, or produces power. Okay, easy peasy. Now, because the fluid flow is doing work on the blades, that means that the enthalpy of your fluid flow going through the turbine is dropping. So I have like H1 right here, and I'll have H2 afterwards, and H2 is gonna be less than H1 in a turbine. Cause it's going to drop, it's doing work, it's losing energy. Okay, what is a compressor? Well, a compressor, as well as pumps, as well as fans, they're simply going to increase the pressure of a fluid. And so since they're increasing the pressure of a fluid, that means that the enthalpy of a fluid going through a compressor, a pump, or a fan will increase. And depending on what you're, you know, which one of these are, it could be more or less. Compressors, quite a bit of enthalpy. Pumps, a little bit. Fans, pretty much nothing because they're really not increasing the pressure all that much. And so these are doing work on the flow, and so my enthalpy is increasing. Um, as a note, where does the power come for this compressor? Usually it comes from a turbine. Some of the energy that you use or create from the turbine goes back to running the compressor. And so, come back here. Fans, yes, I said they're kind of like a compressor. Compressors kind of like fans, but fans are just very inefficient. They're just trying to move the air slightly, not nearly as much as a compressor is. And to differentiate between a compressor and a pump, compressors work with gases, pumps typically work with liquids, okay? And since it's working with a liquid, when you increase the pressure of a liquid, it really doesn't change the enthalpy all that much. Um, while if you increase the pressure of a gas, it can increase the enthalpy quite a bit. There's a very big difference there. Okay, like last time, let's do a problem. So here we go. And you're like, whoa, there's a lot of stuff there. There totally is. So what we have, steam turbine. Yes, that's a steam turbine. That's how it's always drawn in pictures. And guess how compression is drawn? Like that, reversed. Um, it's just standard things. And it is like, you know, making sense because you have the blades and they get bigger as you go along and the flow expands. So it starts with very, very small blades and they get to very, very big blades. So it is drawn that way for a reason. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare the change in enthalpy, kinetic energy and potential energy um, for this system. We're also gonna determine the mass flow rate. How are we gonna do that? Well, we know how much power is being produced so we can figure out how much energy change there is from one side to the other, so we can figure out the mass flow rate. So let's get to it. Okay, first thing we could do is hit up the superheated table. Now, why in the world am I hitting up the superheated table? Well, the reason is because I know um, I've got pressure and a temperature right here, okay? I also have a pressure right here, but I've got a quality. I know that this guy right here is a saturated mixture. This guy right here, though, I don't know what it is. And something I've told you before is that if you have nice round numbers for both your pressure and your temperature, you're, you're probably superheated. It's not guaranteed, like you might have just magically hit the perfect number, um, but you're probably superheated if you have nice round numbers. And the problems are trying to kind of help you out with that. So if you see nice round numbers for both, go to the superheated tables, okay? And so that's what we're gonna do. Now I'm gonna jump there with you as we do this because I want you to see how you can check yourself just in case you actually made a mistake. Okay, so let's get that set up. Why are we going there? We're doing that to find the enthalpy. That's the big thing here. We need to know what the enthalpy change is. We have velocities, we have um, heights, we don't have enthalpy, so that's what we have to get. So let's jump to those superheated tables right now. Okay, everyone, so once again, I'm right back here at our appendix, and I'm gonna jump to the superheated water tables. So I'm gonna click on it. 
and it said 2 megapascals and 400 degrees Celsius. So here's the thing. First off, look and notice these numbers. These are all in megapascals. If you have a smaller number, like 200 kilopascals, be very careful because you have to go way back up here and find 0.2. I don't want that to confuse you. But I'm at 2 megapascals. So I'm going to go down here. So here's 2 megapascals. And if you look at this number right here, you'll see a temperature. Now that temperature is the saturation temperature for 2 megapascals. And if you've forgotten what that means, it simply means if I have a temperature that is greater than 212 degrees Celsius, I am at a superheated vapor. So we have 400 degrees Celsius. 400 degrees Celsius is greater than 212, and therefore I have a superheated vapor. So I'm going to go down over here. You see 400 degrees. I go across, all the way across, until I get to these numbers. The first one is specific volume, the second internal energy, the third one is enthalpy. So there's my number right there, 3248.4. If you're struggling with these kind of things, it might be good to take a picture and use like some sort of tablet to draw on this. Or if you have a physical copy of your textbook, using a ruler can be really helpful because there's just so many numbers right here, it can be overwhelming. Okay, so let's jump back to our problem. So we have the enthalpy from the first step. Now we're going to have to get the properties at the exit because we need the enthalpy at the end too. So this isn't too hard. I've already done the tables once, so I'm not going to go back to it again here. All I did is I used the basic enthalpy equation. We learned this in chapter three. We used it a lot in chapter four, so hopefully you're familiar with it by now. Um, and we need the enthalpy of a saturated liquid. We need the difference in enthalpy between a saturated liquid and a saturated vapor at our particular pressure, which it gave us, 15 kilopascals. And we use our quality to figure out, well, what's the value by averaging those two properties together. What we get is that our enthalpy at the end is 2,361 kilojoules per kilogram. Notice it dropped. Why did it drop? Because it went through a turbine. When it goes through a turbine, we lose enthalpy. Okay, or should we say we use enthalpy. Now we're going to compare the formulas with energy. We're going to see which one is making the most change. So first off, my change in enthalpy is negative 887.44 kilojoules per kilogram. That's going to producing the power. So it's not bad that it's negative. That just means that I'm using the energy from the flow like I'm supposed to be. I want to do that. How about kinetic energy and potential energy? Well, kinetic energy, notice this is lowercase k. Well, that's v squared, or v2 squared minus v1 squared. So my second velocity squared minus my first velocity squared all over 2. That's 14.95 kilojoules per kilogram. As a note, I didn't give a one little conversion in here. But just so you remember, um, 1,000 meters squared per second squared is equal to 1 kilojoule per kilogram. You need to know that for getting to here. Because I did have to do that conversion. The last one is my change in potential energy. So I go from a height of 10 meters to a height of 6 meters, and that gives me a glorious 0 0.04 kilojoules per kilogram. At this point, you can probably realize why we usually just ignore potential energy and kinetic energy, because those changes um, and the amount of enthalpy that changes for them is really tiny compared to um, seeing how much energy we have here just from like temperatures and pressure changes. Okay, that's where the real energy is coming from. Okay, the last thing it asked us to do is find the mass flow rate. So let's do that. How are we going to do it? Setting up our energy balance. So we know that the energy flow in is equal to our energy flow out. Good. And I can plug it in here. You're like, what? The full form? Yes, the full form here. I have to do the full form. Why? Because I have both potential energy changes. I have kinetic energy changes, I have enthalpy changes, and I also have some sort of power output. If you're wondering why this guy went on the right side, realize that it's going out. That's why it's on the outside. So I plug in all my numbers, and what I get then is that my lowercase w out, which is all of these guys, oops, sorry, all of these guys, is equal to 872.48 kilojoules per kilogram. And since I made five megawatts of power, I can then calculate it. So my mass flow rate is gonna be equal to my power output over the energy per kilogram being produced. So 
going to be 5.73 kilograms per second. Now if this confused you a little bit, like where did this come from? It's just from our definitions of the w dot and the lowercase things. So that's equal to m dot lowercase w. And so I just rearranged there. But that's it. So we figured out our mass flow rate. We figured out that, my goodness, the temperature and pressure changes completely dominate when it comes to enthalpy. Um, and the kinetic energy and potential energy changes really don't do much. So hope this helps you. I'll see you all next time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.